Hi, good day and good evening, everyone. It's nice to see you all here. I'm glad you all find the time for us today. Please let me know if you can hear me before we start and I will appreciate this, this information. Just please type uh, that everything's fine, I hope, in the chat section so we can start. I'm Sophie and I will be your host today. And welcome to IVF webinars by Egg Donation friends. We are meeting here for some time now, here every week, and uh, we have a huge, vast source of knowledge on our website, and you can find over 50 IVF webinars so, so far, also with hundreds of questions answered by our experts, so just feel free to use it, share it with others, and just enjoy it. IVF webinars are brought to you with the help of our partners, Eisel Spende, Fertility Clinics okay. Abroad, and Donor Conception Network. And today we are here to talk about strategies for dealing with infertility, stress, and managing your relationship, family, and work. And let me welcome our great guest speaker, Lisa Schumann, straight from New York. Hi, Lisa. Hi. Hello, Hi. everyone. Thank you for coming. Hi, uh, Lisa is a licensed clinical social worker and founder director of the Center for Family Building, the former chair of the Egg Freezing Task Force for the Mental Health Professional Group of the ASRM from the inception in 2008 until 2016. She sat on the board of the American Fertility Association and was a group leader for Resolve, three times awarded by the American Society of Reproductive Medicine. And Lisa is also experienced in every possible way while building her own family. Before Lisa will take over, I will just remind you that this webinar is being recorded and the rewatch the recording from today will be available on our website tomorrow, so you can uh, access it without any limitations and watch it again, share it, or just use it as you wish. Okay, Lisa, are you ready to start? Yes, I'm ready. Thank you so much, Sophie. Really appreciate this. And I just want to say thank you to Egg Donation Friends for having me. This is a tremendous resource for patients, and I really appreciate you're all out there. So yes. thank you. So fingers crossed, Lisa, thank you uh, very much, and let's do this. Okay. So um, as Sophie just mentioned, I'm the director of a group called the Center for Family Building. I'm also director of a um, mental health program for a fertility clinic in Connecticut called Reproductive Medicine Associates of Connecticut. I've worked at several fertility clinics and I now work with many fertility clinics within my program. And um, just to let you know, I started this program because I've been working in this industry for over 20 years, over 23 years now, I don't want to age myself. And, um, you know, through all of these years of experience and also through my own fertility journey, I've seen so many things change in the industry for the better in terms of uh, fertility treatment getting much better and the treatment becoming um, more automated and um, more friendly to patients. And there's just so many more benefits than there were 20 years ago. But what still exists is some holes in the industry. I think that a lot of patients don't get everything that they need. Um, and so that's why I started this group because I really felt that patients can have an easier journey. They can have an easier journey going through fertility treatment and they can also have an easier journey parenting their children. And as they say, you don't know what you don't know. And so we try to um, offer information to people and we do counseling by Zoom. We do counseling in person. We have groups. Next week we um, are running a, a drop-in group and you can email me at lisa at familybuilding.net if you'd like to um, register for that. We have lots of products on our website, all available. We have a book on Amazon, which I'll talk about that as well to help you um, tell your story to your children. And so we, we've created this, this full program to really help patients have an easier journey. And um, we know it can be so hard, which I'll talk about, and we just wanna make it easier. So with that, um, I am going to start to advance my slides and we'll get into it. 
and it's not advancing. Let's see. Yes, you might be. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay. <clears throat> so just to start, um, as you know, many people feel very badly about treatment, and I'm going to talk about that. But there's a big misconception. No matter how many times a doctor tells his patient they're not responsible for their infertility, people, women in particular, feel very responsible for their infertility. And um, there are a number of reasons why, and we're going to talk about this. But first, I want to dispel that myth. Um, so let's first think about what's true about the relationship between anxiety and depression and infertility. So the first thing we can think about is just to kind of get off the table, does stress or depression cause infertility? And a lot of people think about that. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of slides very quickly. It's a little brain numbing if you look at it, but basically these are meta-analysis, mean, meaning that there are many, many studies that are combined um, into one slide here, and I'm, I'll show you a few of them. Um, my friend and colleague, Angela Lawson, shared some of the, this information with me because um, she um, does some work in this area. But I'm just showing this to you so that you understand that there have been many, many studies done, uh, and there's really no proof that um, depression causes infertility or anxiety for that matter. And here's another slide. There have been you know, small questions about whether or not um, certain types of anxiety will contribute, but there's really no way um, that that's ever been proven. So once that's, since that's out of the way, let's look at the other side of it. Does infertility cause depression, depression or stress? And I think without a doubt, all of you will probably say yes to that. Um, in fact, we, we know that um, going through infertility treatment unsuccessfully can feel equal to in depression as women going through, through chemotherapy. So women who are in chemotherapy, they're fighting for their lives because of ca a cancer diagnosis. They can feel the same level of depression as infertility patients. And as we can see on the slide, um, it continues to get harder and harder as you go through treatment. You get more and more depressed potentially as you go through it. And why is this? <clears throat> why, why does this happen? What gets triggered inside of us? Now, uh, apart from what happens in the clinic, what happens inside of us? So what, what happens is something called the fight or flight response. And that is a response that our body naturally feels when it feels like there's a perceived or real um, danger or threat out there. And typically the average American has 50 responses a day to stress and that alone is too much. And so we have many more when we go through infertility treatment and it's really not good for our health. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So um, how did this develop? Briefly, you know, in caveman times, if you think about it, they, the cavemen who survived were the ones who were who had to be able to spot a bear or run away from a tiger. And so those people were uh, poised when they felt nervous that there was some danger around the corner to, to fight or, or flight. So they would be able to run away or fight. And that is a mechanism that our body naturally does. And the people who were really good at it, of course, were the people who survived. And we are um, the descendants of these people who um, were very good at it, which means we are very skilled at feeling that fight or flight response. What happens when we have the fight or flight response? Well, all of these things potentially happen to us because the cortisol levels, which are the stress hormone, um, build up in our system, and we can have higher blood pressure, it increases, uh, increases blood sugar levels, um, we, we can have an experience of having um, a lower immune system, we, um, it increases um, fat storage in your body, so all of these can contribute to lots of problems, including health problems uh, and heart problems. Now, the symptoms of stress can be physical, psychological, behavioral, as you know, and I think it's a, maybe a good moment now to think about your own stress-related symptoms. Um, where do you feel it in your body when you know this is starting? Because that could be a good place to start to work on some strategies to help yourself. So, so typically, um, we know that people have these physical sim symptoms. They'll have insomnia, headaches, back pain, 
all of these physical symptoms. Um, they also have psychological symptoms, irritability, they, they might you know, snap at their partner or get angry, they're forgetful, they're preoccupied. Um, we know all those experiences. And then, um, you know, of course, as it goes on, we have all of these other health problems because of it. So when men are stressed, um, they tend to watch more television, they tend to drink more alcohol, and then, of course, they, they want to fix things. So they try to fix things, and then they want to move on. And so they feel like, okay, I'm going to look for an answer. I'm going to get a diagnosis from the doctor. I'm going to do it as the doctor says. And then I'm just going to think about it when I need to. But women, as you probably know, are very different. Um, women tend to exercise less, eat more junk food, um, sweet and salty junk food. Um, and, of course, you know, they try to plan ahead and do everything, right? They're planning a for every possible scenario that could be around the corner, and they want to do it all, which, as you can imagine, is not um, healthy for you. And it's not healthy for the relationship. The relationship can be um, very strained in that, that you'll feel out of step with each other, you feel like you don't understand each other, because here you are maybe for the first time in your lives, and you're feeling differently about the same thing. And it's something that's tremendously important to both of you, particularly for women. Um, they really take it to heart. And, they, and the husband and the wife, if you're a heterosexual couple, and sometimes, um, you know, if you're a same-sex couple, you'll have one person feeling different than the other. But sometimes the, fam the couples don't feel the same. And then they look at each other and say, well, wait a minute, isn't this the person that I wanted to spend my life with? And I thought we had the same views of the world, and I thought... They were similar. I see a lot of husbands coming into my office saying, my wife is going crazy and I don't understand it. I don't know what to do about it. Not that he doesn't care about his wife or about having a baby, but he's not feeling it the same way she is. And so the, the couple can feel really strange because they feel like all of a sudden they don't understand each other anymore. Um, so let's talk, talk about a few things we can do about the relationship. And remember, there's a lot of information um, that I can share. And again, you can always email me. I'm, I've really put two um, presentations into one for this. So a lot of this information I'm sharing with you is abbreviated. And I'm just taking like a 360 view and giving you an overview here. But again, you can um, ask questions at the end and email me anytime. So a few things you can do um, for the relationship. Couples counseling is fabulous. It really can get couples on the same page. And of course, it's very important to have a counselor who is um, trained from the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and really understands what couples go through um, when they have this um, you know, kind of life-changing experience. As you know, lots of people who haven't been through it don't understand it. And so in order to fix um, the relationship, it's really helpful to have someone, a therapist who understands so you don't have to explain everything. Um, and remember that just because you're experiencing different things doesn't mean you don't love each other, doesn't mean that you can't be a partner for the, the rest of your lives. And it's really important to respect that you're different. And that's really hard for a lot of people to wrap their minds around. Um, <clears throat> take time to do enjoyable activities together, even if you go for a walk every night after dinner, um, you may not feel like it, but it's really important to try to stay connected. This experience might pull you apart and one person might be on the couch, the other person's in the kitchen, and then you just kind of fall in bed at night. But it's really important to try to schedule pleasurable activities together. Um, and I suggest that um, you keep fertility treatment discussions to 20 minutes. So even though that might seem a lot for, for the husband and not so much for the wife, it really gives you the opportunity to um, minimize the way that this sort of experience can infiltrate your whole lives and really start to kind of poison everything that's going on in your life. It's, it's very difficult. You know, um, lots of people spend hours and hours with Dr. Google, which, you know, is not a good idea. Um, and then they want to tell their partner every single thing they've read. And before you know it, there's nothing else you're talking about. So um, the idea would be at the end of the day, you have 20 minutes to each talk about your fertility treatment or how you're feeling about it or next steps. And then after that, you watch a movie or you go for a walk or do something like that. And then if you 
during the day or later that evening, you have more questions or thoughts, you write them down on a piece of paper. And then the next day you add it to your conversation, your 20 minute conversation. Um, now, a few things you can do for yourself. And, um, you know, a lot of people feel, as you can see in this um, funny cartoon, a lot of people feel like meditation is just too difficult. And I understand that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in the next slide. But um, there are a lot of short meditation techniques that can really um, be easy. And you have to remember, it's not uh, a, an achievement, it's a practice. So you don't have to be good at it. And the same thing with yoga. If you feel like you, um, you're not good at yoga, that's okay, it's a practice. There, is, um, there are fertile yoga programs that really are sensitive to people going through fertility treatment. And I, I definitely suggest doing that. If you feel like meditation is too hard, you can be moving. It's like a moving meditation. And of course, counseling is really indispensable to have a place to not just release your feelings every week so you can leave a little bit lighter, but also to be able to have a place where you can process some of this information and really get some clarity on what's happening and next steps and how to manage the relationship and all of that. Um, it's important to connect with others. It's very typical for people to isolate when they're going through this and isolation is poison. It makes things so much worse. Um, you know, in the most severe cases you see these you know, suicides of celebrities, and many of them um, really isolated themselves a lot with their depression and did not talk about it and weren't out in the world. It's really important to get out with others, whatever that means for you. Um, next is um, something that I think is really beneficial, and that is find activities that were that are within your control and make them part of your weekly plan. So by that, I mean, if you think about fertility treatment, you're really a passenger, right? And most of your life, you are in situations where if you put more energy into something, then you get more benefit, right? You study hard in school, you get good grades. If you date a lot, you find the partner of your dreams. And, you know, society and our upbringing tells us if we really focus on something, we'll get more from it. Well, that paradigm does not work in fertility treatment, as you know, because focusing on fertility treatment as you're going through it is like watching grass grow. Even if you're going through uh, the donor egg process and you're not taking, you know, the same hormones, it's still very, very difficult to focus on it and um, think about it every single day. And so even though there's this instinct, this impulse to try to focus on it, it's really not helpful. It's gonna make the treatment go so much slower. And what you really wanna do is close your eyes and wake up and be pregnant, right? So, um, so if you can find places in your life where you can take that sense of control that your body is kind of craving, and put it someplace else that's enjoyable, so not a work project or things like that, um, you can find very often that your body will feel more in balance. So for example, if you say, you know, my partner and I are going to start taking a cooking class, or I'm gonna start, I'm gonna learn needlepoint and I'm gonna take a class to do that, or I wanna redecorate my living room, I'm gonna paint it and move the furniture around and get books about it and start this project, and if you give your time, yourself time every week, several days a week, um, to do whatever this activity is, you'll find that it, it can really help balance your feelings. And if you put it on your schedule, then it's just something that you're going to do, you know, every few days. It takes you out of your head and gives you something to feel productive about and helps you feel more balanced. Um, and, you know, with all of these suggestions, um, you have to find what works for you. There's no right answer for everybody. Everyone's different. And so you really need to respect yourself and not get down on yourself if you feel like this thing is working or that thing is not working um, and you feel like it should be working. There's no right answer. It's really important. Um, I also miss journaling. Journaling has also been found to be tremendously helpful to people. Um, just to journal every night, just get your thoughts down on paper and just do like this brain dump. So you get it out of your body and you put it down on paper. You can scribble it so that you never read it again. It doesn't really matter. It's just helpful to kind of get that going as part of you know daily practice. So just back to the idea of this meditation. So there, there was a... Um, uh, a doctor named Dr. Herbert Benson, who uh, worked at Harvard, and he 
took a trip to India and he found that um, he, when he met with a lot of these monks who had lived in these, these ashrams, that they were able to control their heart rate and blood pressure just at will. And he thought that was fascinating. And so he came back to the U.S. and modified it for the American lifestyle. And um, he actually has a book called Re Relaxation Response. And um, all of our understanding about um, short breathing exercises and different types of breathing exercises really came from him originally. Um, and it, it, it was designed to counteract this fight or flight experience. And it really can be helpful. There are a lot of great apps. Um, Furticom is great. Um, there's also um, Headspace or Calm. There's lots of meditation apps that are very short and they're guided meditations. And so they're um, easier to use. I suggest um, trying them for 10 days straight as you, you'll probably see a lot of them give you this like free 10 day trial. And the reason is because you will feel a sense of real, a little relaxation after you do the exercise. But if you do it consistently every day, at the end of seven to 10 days, you'll also have a bit of a spillover effect. So you'll feel a better sense of well-being overall. It won't just be that little um, notch of, of relief that you find from that daily you know, or periodic um, meditation. So doing it every day, even if you can say, ideally, I'm gonna get up 10 minutes early every day and I'm just going to do this breathing practice and listen to it so I don't really have to just be alone in my head and have that guide me, it, it, can, it can be really helpful. So with all of these things, I think it's important to, to know that, that, as I said, not only does not one size fit all, but you may want to try a bunch of these different strategies because as you can see um, you know, from this slide, it's, it, it's this huge Herculean test to ask yourself just to feel better when you're going through one of life's most stressful experiences. And so you need to find what works for you, but you can also try several of these things and incorporate them into your life. So I'm going to give you some practical tips um, that you can also use, and there are many of them. So you'll have a recording of this webinar, but, it, but you may also want to take notes if you find any of them might be appealing to you. Um, there is a strategy called discard, uh, delegate, or delay. So if you feel like your life is just crazy and you're going to monitoring appointments or you're going to doctor's appointments and you've got so much going on, for this period of time um, in your life, and it's not gonna last forever, you can discard, delegate, or delay a lot of responsibilities that you might not need. And that's a good system to do, kind of look at your to-do list and see what you can discard, delegate, or delay and take them off your to-do list and put them on a list for next month. And don't look at it until then if you don't need to. Um, there are a lot of mindset techniques that are great to use. And you know, again, if you want to email me, we can talk about it. But um, one of them is if you can find five things to feel good about every day and focus on them one at a time, um, and then you can write them down in your journal because that'll make it even more effective. But if you can do that every single day, it can be hugely um, effective. You know, there's the saying, gratitude will help your attitude. Well, it's, it's really true. It really can help you. Even when you feel crummy and you feel like I have nothing to feel grateful for today, just the fact that the sun's shining, just the fact that your heart's beating in your chest and you can breathe, just the fact that, you know, you have a best friend that you adore, you love your job, any, it doesn't, you love the new shoes you bought. It doesn't have to be anything in particular, but if you can do that each day, that can be helpful. Um, the next is to put more good in your life. A lot of this experience of infertility is kind of bringing everything down. It's making you feel heavy. It's making you feel sad. It's making you feel drained. So it's good to have an infusion of some good in your life. Um, so if you can schedule activities, let's say you're starting your treatment and you know that you're going to be going through treatment you know, for the next month or maybe six weeks or eight weeks, depending upon your protocol and what you need to do, you know, get a calendar out, look at it, and apart from the the um, exercise, which I, I explained before, to have productive activities, also schedule enjoyable activities. So maybe like 
you know, once a week you get theater um, tickets for you and your partner or a friend. Or maybe you say, okay, my goal for the next two months is my partner and I are going to hike every single trail in this area. Or I'm going to um, go to this lecture series. Or I'm going to take on a new language and I'm going to go to this class twice a week. Whatever it is. It's really good to put that in your calendar because on the days when you come home and you feel really crummy and you don't want to go, you have to go. You've paid for it. It's done. You're going. You're going no matter what. Um, or you've scheduled it and you have somebody to be accountable to. And the second part is a lot of people say, well, you know, I went to this show or I went to this movie and, you know, I still couldn't get it out of my head. I understand that. You can't get away from it. And even if you could get away from it, the clinic is going to remind you that you have things to do. So there's no getting away from it. But if you are sitting in the theater and let's say 50% of the time you're thinking about what's next with your fertility treatment and 50% of it you're not thinking about it, that's 50% better than you would have been otherwise. And that is definitely an improvement. So it's worthwhile. Um, and then as I said, to good, good, it's good to feel productive and um, not to isolate. It's really important to get su support. Um, some more practical tips, and I put this little image here because I think some of these tips can really feel empowering. You know, they say when you public speak, it's good to have this Wonder Woman pose. It's the same sort of thing. When you start to incorporate these things into your life, it makes you feel more powerful. It makes you feel like you're not a victim. And you are a passenger. There's nothing you can do about it. The doctor's going to give you a protocol and you're going to follow it and you're in the passenger seat. And it's going to feel like you're knocking your head against the wall because you can't do anything to change it. You can't get inside of your body and move things around. You can't change your medication. But when you do some of these things, you can really feel empowered, like you're taking your life back a little bit. Um, now, it's important to, to have limitations. Um, I said it's good to get out. But... If there are things that are exceptionally painful, don't force yourself. Again, this is not going to be for the rest of your life. And so you don't have to go to every single baby shower, every single christening. Um, it's not important to, to do that. Um, follow the 80-20 rule of eating well. You know, we, as I said earlier, women tend to feel, um, when they feel bad, they tend to eat crummy foods. Um, if you can have a goal, not 100%, but 80% of the time you're going to eat well, it can really help you. You know, a little bit is better than nothing, again. And it's really helpful, not just to your body, but to your state of mind, because sugar will make you eventually feel crummy, right? You're going to, blood sugar is going to really drop. And if you're eating a lot of junk food, it could be bad for your digestive system and make you feel kind of icky. So, um, you know, ultimately, as you know, it's not great for you. But if you can just kind of cut back on the negative foods and add some positive foods, you'll feel empowered, like you're really doing something for yourself. And that's a nice feeling. Um, exercise in any way you can, even if you feel like you can't do much. Um, of course, if you're on bed rest, there's not much you can do. Um, but, you know, generally walking, swimming, playing pool, you know, gardening, any of those things could be just getting outside can really feel good. And again, not one of these things is going to cure everything for you, but it will all help you get through the treatment process. And that's the goal, is just to get through it. And I will talk about that more in a few minutes. Um, so what about friends and family? Because friends and family can be tricky and um, can be difficult. We know that that very often they want to be helpful. And even though it might feel that they don't want to be helpful, that they're just saying these hurtful things, or intrusive things, um, they, they many of them just don't understand. It's really hard to understand how depressing this experience can be if you haven't been there. And you know, for people who are just starting to um, go to a donation, even that process, if they're not in treatment, just going through that process of trying to try to to make what so was once so unfamiliar to them, then make it familiar and be able to digest all the effects that they need to know and all the information that they need to understand for their children in the future. It could just be so overwhelming. So, um, you know, when you're going through this, you're going to be very stressed and probably not feel great if somebody says something intrusive, even if 
they don't mean it. But I think it's good to remember that very often they don't mean it. And then, of course, um, they or other people will make um, all sorts of comments that are not helpful. So, you know, people say, oh, I have a friend who adopted and got pregnant, and or just relax and you'll get pregnant, or do this and you'll get pregnant, or go to this doctor. And we have no evidence that any of these things work. I have, I have researched this and I can promise you, um, number one, none of them are true um, in general. Number, number two, there is no way to know if that person who adopted would have done well in fertility treatment anyway um, the next time around. Not everybody is completely infertile. Um, we don't we don't know that the people who went on vacation are just not having more sex. There's no way to to really assess this, but we know that there's really no direct correlation. There's no, and there's no reason to beat yourself up about it. Um, no one, and I put the airplane picture because, you know, as we know, nobody talks about all the wonderful landings that happen every single day all around the world. They just talk about the airplane crashes, right? So. If that one person in a million got pregnant because they, after they adopted a child, everyone's going to talk about it. So uh, you need to put that in context um, and know that these people in your life are, um, you know, they're trying to say the right thing, but they're obviously not. So um, some of the things that you can do is um, if you can um, uh, understand that some of these people are people in your life that you're going to want to have in your life later. They're, they're people who might be really important to you. You don't want to disconnect from them completely. And so try to trying to stay um, minimally contact in minimal contact with them can be really helpful long term. Um, it's really important to think about what you're going to disclose. Lots of people um, come into my my office and they say, you know, I told my family about my treatment and I went through treatment and I had failed IVF cycles and I was thinking about using a donor. And then I finally decided to use a donor and then I had to pick a donor and I was stressed out about that. And now we have a donor and we're going through treatment and I cannot believe I told my family everything because Aunt Sally is telling cousin Sarah and what am I gonna do? And you know, it's true. It's, it's difficult because now people know and people talk and it can be really difficult. Now, there's no right answer to that. And that's, um, you know, for another conversation, there's no right answer to whether or not you want to be completely open or not. You have to do what's right for you. But it's also important to remember that, you know, if you're going to be open about um, ovum donation and to be telling people, then it'll be really important to tell your children when they're babies because you don't want your children's first memory of hearing about their birth story from Aunt Sarah, right? You know, and during like, you know, a Christmas lunch or something. So it's, it, I think it's good to kind of think through these things um, and if you can and just try to kind of minimize the damage if possible. Um, it's good to tell people what you need. If you think about a lot of the people in your life, yes, there may be intrusive people or people who are not so nice, but if you think about people who really care about you and they just say the wrong things, um, I think you can tell them what you, what, they, uh, what you need. So they might be feeling like, oh, should I ask her? Should I not ask her? How many questions should I ask her? If I don't ask her, is she gonna feel offended? And um, if I do ask her, I'm, am I going to be intrusive? And they, they're stuck in a tough situation too. They don't know what to do. So if it's them, or even if it's people who just say the wrong thing, you can say to them, you know, <clears throat> we're going through a lot right now. I don't want to talk about it. Um, but if I have news for you, I promise I will tell you. And until then, um, let's just talk about the weather. Let's talk about the movies. Let's talk about anything else. And if I want to talk about it, I will let you know. Um, but until then, let's just talk about other things. It really can help you not have this burden over your head wondering if this person is going to bring it up or ask you questions or be thinking about it. And it also lets them off the hook. They don't have to feel the pressure of feeling like, what should I do? Should I bring it up? Should I not bring it up? Um, I think it's important, as I said before, that you know, to remember that this is not going to last forever. And I think it's also important to share that with your friends and family. So um, if you can't make 
your cousin, second cousin's daughter's first birthday party or whatever that is, um, it's okay to say to them, look, you know, I can't make it. And it's not that I don't love you. We love you very much. I can't make it this year, but I promise you that I will be there for little Janie's second party and third party and fourth party. Um, it's just this year I have to back out. And that really helps because then people aren't so offended. They know that it's not personal. They know it's situational and it really has to do with you and not with them. It's not that you don't care about them. Um, so it, I think that, that people can handle that a lot better than just not going or going, um, alternatively going and then just feeling horrible yourself. So let's think about putting this all together um, and what this means. Um, so we need we need to kind of know that we can't we can we can't control what goes on outside of us. The only control we have is what goes on inside of us and how we're going to respond to the outside world. Um, you can start to train your mind a little bit and with some of the tips that I suggested, not to get hijacked by your emotions because that ha happens often um, with everyone in life, right? And it can happen when you're in the car or at work or at any time. Um, and so doing some of these um, practices that I suggested will help with that as well. It's not just gonna help with that minute that you're feeling stressed and okay, I'm gonna do a breathing exercise. It will help you, as I said, overall, and can really help you when you go to work and all of a sudden it's you know on your mind and it's hard to focus. Um, and remember, if it helps you 60% of the time, that's still better than zero. Um, so <laughs> remember your partner and you don't always see necessarily see eye to eye on everything but there are things you can do to stay close and that's really important you know you need to stay close and stay connected because you want to have an intact relationship when this is all over um, you can manage the da damage with friends and family um, by some of the suggestions i recommended and there are lots of other suggestions i can recommend but i think some of those are, are really helpful in trying to manage some of the damage long-term and short-term with your friends and family. Um, people feel helpless. That's one of the hallmarks of feeling out of control. Um, and as I said, it can feel really empowering. It's good to remember I'm doing this, whatever this activity is or whatever the strategy is, and I'm empowering myself. I feel out of control. I feel like I, I have no control in this process but you can control your body and you can take control of what happens inside of you much better um, than just kind of following the process and feeling like a passenger who's kind of knocked around all the time. Um, and um, the, the thing that, that, it, that we find in research that I think is really, really important to know is that not only will all of these activities make you healthier and happier, we talked about the health benefits and about the relationship benefits, but it can also help you get through treatment. Um, there was a, a study done several years ago at Boston IVF, and they, they, they did this research because in Massachusetts, there's mandatory coverage, meaning that the fertility treatment needs to be um, covered. And so you would think that people would just continue to go through fertility treatment over and over again until they got pregnant, right? Because if, if it's free and the insurance is covering it, why wouldn't they? Well, people actually still dropped out of those clinics because of stress. Even though the fertility treatment was paid for, it was just too stressful for them to continue. And your goal is this cute little picture. You wanna have um, the baby and you wanna feel intact inside of yourself and in your relationships. And so the way to get there is to try to engage some of these um, strategies or other strategies you may find. And remember that you can have some control over your state of being, and that will ultimately help you get to your end goal because it will help treatment go faster and it will make everything a little bit better for, better for you. So all you can do is keep calm and just do your best at all of these things. So I wanna thank you for your time. Um, that is the conclusion of my, um, my talk for today. Um, you can always reach out to me at Lisa at familybuilding.net. Please visit our website at www.familybuilding.net. We have a great um, newsletter um, and it, it's really uh, wonderful with lots of information. We do workshops for donor conceived children. 
again, I, we have this life book that is really helpful to journal your story for your child. We have um, eBooks, we have videotapes, um, that you, videos that you can download. See, I'm showing my age. Uh, videos that you can download and um, a really terrific um, video series on, called Developmental Steps, which helps people understand the different steps people go, children go through as they grow older when they're donor conceived. So um, take a look and feel free to reach out to me anytime. So thank you for joining me. Thank you, Lisa, for all the information and the support you gave us so far. You're welcome. We will then take a look for the questions and I encourage everybody who would like to ask a question to type questions in the chat section uh, so we can ask them uh, one by one. We have okay. uh, for the beginning, uh, the first question, which will be this one. Uh, could you please repeat the med meditation apps uh, that yeah. you were recommending? Okay, so one uh, app that's a fertility app, there's some um, breathing exercises on it, but also some advice and that's called Ferticom, F-E-R-T-I-C-A-L-M. Um, and my, my good friends and colleagues developed that app. They've they have tremendous experience and have done a beautiful job putting it together. Um, the next one I would recommend is called Headspace, and that's not a fertility um, app. It's a meditation app, but they have short meditations that you can do. They have um, like a two minute or a five minute, and it's all guided, and there are lots of cute cartoons that kind of guide you around um, the meditation experience. And it's really fun to listen to and um, makes it a lot easier. So I would recommend that. And then the third one, um, and every, this is about you know taste, um, is Calm, C-A-L-M. And that um, is uh, nice, also it gives you an opportunity to um, learn by guided meditation and it's kind of entertaining and all of that. Um, there aren't those cartoons, but it, they have lots of other things. And they also have um, different background um, sounds that you can listen to. So they have like beach sounds or uh, falling rain in the forest or wind. So you can listen to any of those sort of relaxing sounds while you're doing the meditation. So any one of those three, I think would be terrific to get started with. But, you know, feel free to try them all, all on. You know, I, I wouldn't abandon your effort if one doesn't work. I would say try one. If it doesn't work, try something else. Thank you a lot for your advices. You're welcome. Mm, we will then take a look for the next question. And this will be this one. After two failed egg donation IVF, we're taking a break and I've started doing yoga and meditation and I mean to do third one final cycle at the end of the year. I've read conflicting info about whether you can continue with yoga during the cycle before transfer or not. When should you stop? Um, well, I think you, number one, I think you have to talk to your doctor, um, because every person is different. You know, some people, just for example, if your body is full of fluid and let's say you're really stimulated and you have 20 eggs, it may not be wise to do any sort of experience where you're jumping. Like if you're in, in, um, doing, um, um, a downward dog and then you go to jump to standing it might not be great because you might be jumping around and kind of jostling your ovaries. Um, a lot of people say the downward dog uh, position is not great after implantation necessarily, like any upside down poses may not be um, great. So I think you have to ask your doctor about that first and then also consider what type of yoga you're doing. Um, of course, you know, the Ashtanga yoga is much more aggressive. They're much more meditative and relaxing. Restorative yoga is wonderful. It's, um, you know, really can help your mood and is also very gentle. Um, and then as I said earlier, there is uh, this fertile yoga um, which some clinics have, and sometimes you can access it online as well. And that you can do in any state. Um, you know, even if you're kind of on semi bed rest, you can do it in a chair. 
So um, I think it really depends upon your, your, you haven't had a transfer yet, but how stimulated you are and what shape your body is in if you really feel comfortable because if your ovaries are full of eggs and your body's full of fluid, you don't want to be jumping around or doing any upside down poses. You can kind of twist your ovaries. So I would talk to the doctor about that and really consider which type of yoga you're using. And thank you for explaining this as well. You're welcome. To us. Um, I would encourage everybody to type a question. Don't be shy and uh, take the chance to ask Lisa uh, about any doubts you may have. We will then uh, also take the next question, which we have for now. Just wondering about an embryo transfer and the time just before the procedure, if there is anything we could do to calm down, as I read the, that stress may impact the embryo implantation. Not obviously the same question concerned the time after the embryo transfer. Okay. And obvious. Um, so first of all, I'm going to go backwards here. So the after the embryo transfer, there's been a lot of research, and you can you know you're again you need to talk to your doctor. But um, there's been a lot. It used to be 20 years ago they'd say after the embryo transfer, go home, lie down, relax, watch movies, don't get up, just be you know horizontal. And now a lot of research is showing it's not really helpful to do that. You don't want to be jumping up and running around after the transfer, but they say it's it's better just to kind of stand up and take relaxing walks and just take it easy, but not to be horizontal, um, just to kind of keep your blood flow going and to be in the position of being, you know, vertical more. Um, so there's been a lot of um, suggestions about that. And then um, about calming down, I definitely think that um, it can be really helpful to do some of these meditations ahead of time and see what works for you. Because if you find something that's working for you, then you can do it before of the transfer. I, I don't think that if you're stressed, um, you're, you were, um, it's going to change your implantation. Remember, people who have been raped get pregnant. People got pregnant in the Holocaust. So there are tremendously stressful situations in this world where people get pregnant. So I don't think that that's good. If you are more st stressed at that moment, um, it's going to impact implantation. But I do think that you're going to feel uh, likely to feel badly about it, which I don't, that's what I don't want. I don't want you to beat yourself up about it. So if, you, if you're just trying to experiment with some different types of breathing exercises, um, some people like to do acupuncture before that they take an, have an acupuncture um, appointment before they go in for their transfer. Um, you know, lots of people do that. It kind of calms them down, calms down their body. Some people say they, they, or there was some old research that's kind of been disputed that maybe it helps with blood flow. So I think if you can, if you want to do something like that um, and experiment with the, those things before you transfer, then you know what works best. And remember, even if you, you know, are relaxing a tiny bit, you know, maybe 10%, it's still better than nothing. It's better than you, you would have been otherwise. And remember, you don't have much control over it. Um, I, I want you to do it because I want you to not beat yourself up and know that you're doing everything you can and that makes you feel good. But ultimately, it's not going to um, affect you. You need to know that you know this is, not, this is not your fault if it doesn't work and it's not your responsibility if the doctor is going to give you the best protocol that they, they know and give you the best opportunity to get pregnant. And you just need to be a passenger and not get mad at yourself. Thank you for the answer and the You're question. Um, we have the up question uh, coming back because maybe you know some other because the first calm app is not available in the uk and uh, maybe you know any other but if not uh, of course <laughs> yeah so then i would try one of the other two either um either headspace or calm yes and thank you for this uh, additional comment uh on that uh somebody's typing and the question, yes, it's coming up. How much the partner should get involved when dealing with stress during the IVF cycle? Obviously, woman is a person involved more into the treatment from medical point of view than the partner. 
Um, so, so how much should the partner get involved um, with the stress? Um, mean, meaning what? Meaning should they should they come to appointments, or are you saying should they be involved in trying to help you feel calm? I, I just want to get clarification on the question. Um, yeah, I, for now we don't have any follow-up comment on that, but if it appears, I will um, display that. But okay. I, I think that it may also uh, be connected to the some kind of feeling that <clears throat> one person is more um, involved and, and, and has much more pressure on her own, and the other is a little... Less, less, let's say men maybe yeah. maybe a little less, <laughs> less involved. involved yeah uh we have yeah we have the additional comment on that so i i mean dealing with the stress alone or with the partner together oh yes i mean <laughs> okay so so uh what i would say is if you feel now some some women feel like, you know what, I just want to talk to my girlfriends. My husband doesn't understand this, and I don't even feel like talking to him about it. But if you feel like you'd like him to be there for you, um, then I think it's good to educate him on how stressful this situation is. Um, maybe you can give him um, a link to this video. Also, I think it's um, uh, Resolve is the uh, National Infertility Organization in the U.S., and you can just look at their website online. They have a lot of fact sheets about um, depression and infertility, and I think if men take a look at that, very often they say, "Oh my gosh, you know, it's just not my wife who's crazy. It's you know, everybody goes through the, this level of stress when they go through this," and um, and then it helps them be more empathic usually. So I think the two of you at that point can talk about what would be helpful to you. So if you say, you know, I'd really like you to, to I'd like to institute this 20 minute rule every night where I can tell you about what's going on and what I'm stressed about. Or, you know, if I cry, please don't, you know, give me answers. I just don't, I don't want you to fix it. I just want you to hug me or I just want you to listen. Or you might say, you know, I really feel like at the end of the day, I'm stressed out and I'd like you to start cooking dinner for the two weeks that I'm, you know, taking medication. Or I would really like you to, you know, rub my feet when we're watching TV. I think being direct, um, just like I was saying about the friends and family, is really the best answer because uh, everyone's different and it's very hard to anticipate their feeling, how you're feeling, particularly because you're your partner is not going to know what's going on inside of you and how to make you feel better. They're just going to see you struggling and not, and really not get it. And so I think it's better to let them know this is what happens. People get depressed and very stressed um, through this. What could be really helpful to me is X. I'd like you to come to set, to point you know, these ultrasounds with me, or I'd like you to do this or that. Um, and so it will give him a job to do and make him feel like, He's really doing something to try to be helpful, and um, he's and then let him know. I really appreciate it because you know positive reinforcement always you know helps to let him know. Yes, I really appreciate you coming to the appointment with me, or um, you know listening to me when I was crying the other night, or whatever it is. Um, you know to let him know I really appreciate your efforts. I know you don't get this, but this is how I'm feeling. I think it's really good to be direct and um, let him know what you need. Thank you for this great piece of advice. You're welcome. And we will then take a look on the next question. And I, of course, uh, encourage you to type the questions because this will be also the final call for the questions. So if anybody would like to ask any other questions, feel free to do that. And the time is now. Um, Yes, this question will be this one. I, I've gone through over 10 IVF procedures and two egg donation transfers, many, many stimulation, also heavy ones, and took a lot of different medicines, also ones for the cancer. Took everything as the doctor said. Now I get stressed already when I only need to take medicines. How to cope if I already get stressed so much at the beginning now? Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, wow. You have really had some bad luck in all of this and some really, really difficult situations. My heart goes out to you. This is really hard. Um, 
you know, you've been through so much and I really think that counseling would be really helpful. Um, I think, you know, your, all of these things that you've been through, um, you know, through the, the cancer treatment and all these IVF procedures and then the egg donation and then the disappointment of that, um, it's, you've had a tremendous amount of emotional trauma and also um, stress on your body and your mind and your spirit. And so I think it's very hard when all of these insults are happening to your body and kind of chipping away at your body little by little, it's very hard to have, you know, any resources left in you to um, manage the next day, right? I mean, it feels like you're kind of operating on empty and you can't operate, drive a car just on fumes, right? You have to fill up your gas tank. You need to start to feel a little bit better so you can can move forward if that's what you want to do. So I really think that um, you know counseling would be helpful. I think trying as many of these other tips would be great, but I really think it would be good to have some counseling. And you may have had um, counseling at um, at the cancer center. They often offer that. But it's really, you know, just for the cancer center and, and the cancer treatment. So I would suggest finding a specialist in fertility and having um, some sessions with them and really trying to work through some of, you know, what you've been through, which is horrible, and um, getting to a place where you feel a little bit better so you can start to move forward. Thank you for the question and thank you for the support, Lisa. Oh, you're welcome. And as somebody is typing, I will uh, also ask you a question. Um, do you have any recommendation or, or maybe there are some practice that you can use on the fly? Is, let's say in front of the annoying auntie who is asking you when you will be having children or yeah, you know, mm -hmm. and what to do when you don't have then time to do the meditation and yoga and just, you know, somehow, uh, <laughs> survive this situation yeah. any practices on the fly which we can use in this hard difficult circumstances so you know stress is kind of like a wave right if you are if you want to surf if you want to surf on a wave it's always better to get onto the wave when it's small right if you wait till the wave is too high it's just going to crash down on you just like this woman was saying, she's been through so much already and you just can't, it's, it probably feels impossible to dig yourself out of all of that. I think she can, and I definitely think with enough support and strategies, she can start to feel better so she'll feel like her gas tank is fuller. Um, but when you feel so depleted and so horrible, you're gonna snap at your auntie, right? Or you're gonna snap at somebody or you're gonna feel really upset and go home crying every moment. Now you might feel that way anyway um, with fertility treatment, but if you haven't been doing things on a regular basis, like some of the things I'm suggesting, your stress level will be up here. So if you take some of these tips and incorporate them into your life, then your stress level is down here. And so when your auntie makes a, a negative comment, it's easier to have the, the wherewithal to respond to her in a calmer way than if your stress level is up here. So I really think it's good to, to incorporate all of these things into your life on a daily basis, and then it brings it down a little bit, um, and so it's easier to respond to her. And I think with um, specifically with the anti situation, as I said earlier, I really think it's helpful to say, you know what, anti, I really love you, but I'm going through a lot right now, and I just don't want to talk about it. Um, if I do have news for you, or if I want to talk about it, I'll let you know but I really don't feel like um, bringing that up. So can we talk about what our plans are for you know, Christmas or whatever it is for next vacation or tell me what happened when you went on you know, vacation last month. So I think giving people instructions is very helpful because then she'll know and that usually shuts it down. Thank you a lot for the next great advice. Uh, now, um... We will jump to the next question. I work 12 hour shifts both day and night. I struggle with good sleep and I'm a career for my mother. 
There is a lot of research which states that sleep is vital for IVF agglutination. Do you have any strategies that I can use to help with this? My job is very demanding. I worry about the pressure there is. So I feel like I have high pressure all around, which I then stress about. So it's a vicious circle. Can you suggest any strategies, please? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, um, I don't know about the research that um, says sleep is vital for IVF. I've been in this industry for 23 years. I work at clinics. I'm uh, I'm very active in um, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine, and I see a lot of research relating to um, infertility and stress, and I've never seen that. So I don't know if that is a respected piece of research or not in my industry. Um, I think that that um, sleep is, being sleep deprived is not good for your health. I don't know that, as I said, people get preg got pregnant in the Holocaust. So these are people who are, you know, starving and sleep deprived. They're completely emaciated and um, under the hugest stress you can imagine. So, and they got pregnant. So I, I think it's important not, not to put that pressure on yourself. But having said that, it's also important to try to find ways to relax um, and find a way to be able to get a little bit better sleep. If you can't take anything for the sleep, you know, some people just will try to kind of get their sleep on a better sleep cycle. Um, and they, oh, I'm sorry about that. Um, I thought that was off. Um, people will try to get themselves on a better sleep cycle. And as they get themselves on a better sleep cycle, then that will continue to get better and better. And, and so some people will take like a Benadryl or Dramamine or something just over the counter just to start sleeping. If you're starting your treatment, you may not be able to do that. And so incorporating some things like I'm suggesting into your daily practice, um, a meditation practice, maybe a yoga practice, being able to get outside and do things so that you feel invigorated and you're a little more tired at night. Um, all of those things can help you. So I would definitely try as many of those things as you can. I know you work a long day and I completely appreciate that. Um, but these things take, you know, 10 minutes. And so um, it can be really, really helpful. Now, if you are able to get some help with your, um, your mother, uh, if you if in any way, that would be great. Um, and some people find that they just, if, if it's too much for them, then they just need to, you know, cut back at work and tell their bosses for the next two weeks, I need, I, you know, I need to leave early or whatever that is if they can. Um, so those are possible, but at the very least, I would say, try some of these strategies and give them, give yourself 10 days, um, with the breathing exercises and with some of the other strategies that I um, suggested and see if it helps you feel a little bit better. Um, and definitely get outside and be able to move your body around so that you'll be tired and a little more tired at night. Thank you a lot, Lisa. And uh, yeah, I will also have a little shout out for you. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for coming. And one more and actually, um, Great. With all those thank yous, I will also tell you that one hour just fly like five minutes mm -hmm. <laughs> or so. And and so we will be slowly finishing our today meeting and we are very happy that you were with us today, this evening. Thank you very much. And speaking about thank yous, yes, thank you everybody who was uh, attending. Uh, today our IVF webinars and thank you Lisa for your time for your knowledge and for your support anything any question maybe which was uh, unanswered we will forward to Lisa directly tomorrow and uh, you will then of course can get in touch with Lisa as well if you want to add anything any final comment Lisa please try do that yes I, I, I just want to say to everyone here remember even though, um, as I said in the very beginning, even though our society tells us that we have to work harder at something to make it work, it's not true with IVF. And that may feel very disappointing because feeling like we have no control over something sometimes almost feels worse than feeling like we can control something and it's not working, right? And so 
we feel like we just want to find an answer, right? We're going to, we're going to find this one study that says you have to sleep more or you have to eat more broccoli or whatever it is. And you feel like if you, if you could just do that, it'll work. I think it's really important, even though it's upsetting to accept that there's not so much control you have over this. And um, you unfortunately will feel like the control is in your doctor's hands and you're going to be a passenger. And the, to the extent that you can incorporate some of these things and try to get at least get treatment, get through treatment in, 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 with as less little stress as possible, it will help treatment go much more quickly and you'll get to the end. And that's really where you want to be. I mean, that's really the only thing that's in your control. We can't control the hormones. We can't make implantation happen. We can't just you know, kind of get a telescope and go inside our bodies and make the embryo attach. Unfortunately, we can't do any of those things, and it's really upsetting and frustrating. But I think if we can accept that and then try to put our energies into things we do have control over, then our treatment process will go much better, and we will be able to stay in treatment and hopefully get pregnant, and things will be much better in the end. And it was fantastic uh, final words, Lisa. So thank, thank you, you for that as well. Okay. And of course, I can only encourage you to follow us on our social media um, YouTube channel where you can find all the IVF webinars, recordings, and there will be also uh, the recording from today. Facebook and Instagram as well. You will be always up to date following us on social media. So just feel free to stay in touch with us. It would be also a great pleasure to have you uh, here on the next IVF webinars. We are planning them week by week. For today, it will be all. Thank you, Lisa, one more time. Thank you. And have a great day and night yeah. wherever you are. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you so much to Egg Donation Friends for having me. Thank you. And it will be a wrap. Bye. Bye.